to welcome you to our session today, um, the second web webinar of the series Pohyad Zlovni, a look from the outside. I'm organizing on behalf of the Postgraduate Society of Cave Mohela Academy. Um, the series is devoted to the Ukrainian topics in linguistics, geography, history, and political science reflected in publications of researchers who work in the UK and the US academic environments. Our goal is to look at Ukrainian issues from the outside to enrich one's perspective with new approaches, methods, and say, a way of thinking. We have a brilliant speaker today, Jonathan Turnbull, um, Johnny is a third year PhD candidate at the Department of Geography at the University of Cambridge. He was graduated from Oxford, where he gained his BA and um, MSc degrees. Now he teaches at, at Cambridge. Johnny lives in Kyiv and um, has been a visiting researcher at Kyiv Mohela Academy for the last two years. Where he has been taking actually Ukrainian classes with me, and um, I can say he's an amazing student. Um, he has also learned Ukrainian at Cambridge. His main interests revolve around non-human animals and the way we study, uh, relate with, and govern uh, them. His PhD research explores uh, the apparent researchers uh, resurgence of nature to the Chernobyl exclusion zone. In particular, he's interested in the ongoing scientific uh, controversy surrounding whether nature is healthy and flourishing in the zone or whether radiation is causing harmful and lasting effects. Um, he focuses specifically on dogs and wolves to explore this question. Uh, with Ukrainian colleagues, he's currently making a film about the dogs who live with the checkpoint guards in the zone. It is a film collaboration with the Ukrainian director, production company Tabor, and um, artist and designer Karolina Uskakovich. Another two projects Jane has worked on are devoted to exploration of human nature relations during lockdown. Uh, so, and human current relationships in India. He's the author of several articles with three papers forthcoming, a co founder of the research group Digital Ecologies with Adam Searle and Henry Anderson Elliott. Johnny is also interested in the conceptual relevance of the term weird in literature and the environmental humanities and the ways it can help understand the human relationship with nature in the Anthropocene. And so it is with great pleasure that we welcome him today to talk on the topic making sense of nature in the Chernobyl exclusion zone. Johnny, привіт. Щиро тебе вітаємо. Я дуже рада, що ти з нами. Передаю тобі слово. Дякую. Um, for the English people, I'm just going to give a short um, introduction in Ukrainian. Um, so you know what's going on. It won't be too long. So, uh, дякую. Um, я хочу почати з невеликого вступу українською мовою. По-перше, uh, дуже дякую, Оксана, uh, що представила мене сьогодні. І дякую, що останні два роки ти була чудовим викладачем української мови. Отже, мене звати Джоні, і я переїхав до Києва в 2019 році, щоб провести докторське дослідження з питань природи в Чорнобильській зоні відчуження. Спочатку я приїхав на 9 місяців, але тут мені так сподобалось, що я не хочу їхати. Так, моє дослідження про історію повернення природи до Чорнобильської зони. Я вивчаю те, як люди взаємодіють із тваринами в зоні. Найбільше мене цікавлять собаки та вовки. Вже 
вже два роки я їжджу в Джорнобил і працюю з науковцями, охоронцями, пункти пропуску, місцевими жителями та туристами. Ми також знімаємо фільм про собак у зоні з моїми колегами. Сьогодні я поговорю про це дослідження, розповім декілька історій про природу в Чорнобилі, вовків, собак і покажу фотографії, які я зробив. Зараз я буду говорити англійською мовою та розповідати більше про свою дисертацію, але якщо хтось має якісь питання українською мовою, будь ласка, задавайте їх і Оксана допоможе з перекладом. Um, дякую, що прийшли, і um, давай. So, uh, hello everyone, and thanks for coming to this talk today. I'm going to talk broadly about my ongoing PhD research in the Chernobyl Exclusion Zone, and talk you through the structure of my thesis, thesis which I'm currently writing. So there's lots of early thoughts being presented here. So, to begin, as many of you know, the Chernobyl Exclusion Zone has become an iconic landscape of toxicity, contamination and pollution, compromising an area, comprising an area of 4,200 kilometers squared in Ukraine and Belarus. The zone was created in 1986 in the aftermath of the world's worst nuclear disaster, which occurred at 23 minutes past one in the morning on the 26th of April, 1986. Following this catastrophe, the Soviet government was forced to permanently evacuate 116,000 people living within a 30 kilometer radius of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, as well as 60,000 cattle. The zone, which can be seen on this map here, is still known as the 30 kilometer exclusion zone, but its boundaries have been changed and renegotiated in the 35 years since the disaster. The current shape reflects the direction that the wind was blowing following the disaster and shows how the fallout was distributed by the weather at the time. Radioactivity from the nuclear disaster was actually first detected in Western Europe by monitoring equipment at a nuclear power station in Sweden, and this was how the West, broadly speaking, came to know of the disaster, which was being concealed by the secretive Soviet Union at the time. So as with all things related to Chernobyl, we find that the distribution of this fallout is itself the product of both social and natural forces. In the days following the nuclear disaster, Soviet authorities sent planes into the sky and released silver iodide, a chemical which causes water to condense. In doing so, they caused the terrain over large swathes of Belarus, contaminating farmland, swampland, and villages alike. The reason behind this was to prevent the cloud of radioactive fallout from reaching Moscow, and this decision meant that Belarus received the majority of the fallout from the disaster. Subsequent mapping of contamination led to further evacuations in Belarus and even in Russia, 150 kilometers to the northeast of the reactor, and eventually around 350,000 people were moved from contaminated areas. So the zone is not this, you know, circular thing, but it's actually, it, it's quite patchy. I don't have the time here to go into the history of the disaster or the technical elements um, of how it actually happened in any more detail than I already have, nor will I discuss the ramifications of um, the disaster in terms of how it affected the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union and the ongoing health impacts in humans. But having spoken to many people uh, who have been personally affected by the disaster when I lived in Slavutich, which was a city built um, for, the, for cleanup workers just outside the zone. It was the last city ever built by the Soviet Union. Um, and also in Kiev, I'm, I'm very sensitive to these issues, but I'm going to focus more broadly here on the effects of radiation on nature, which as we'll actually come to see anyway, um, this does not involve excluding humans. So for those interested specifically in these topics, however, I can recommend these books on the screen now, all of which contain very detailed accounts of the human health consequences, um, and some of them even touch on um, accounts of nature, um, which is my, the focus of my PhD. So to fast forward 35 years from the disaster, the radioactive and other contaminants that were released during the catastrophe in 1986, most notably cesium-137 and strontium-90, continue to persist in the environment and will remain there for countless generations. These radioactive isotopes emit radiation continuously and have half-lives of 30 years and 28 years respectively. This means that it takes around 30, 30 years for their activity to decrease by half, meaning today they are emitting approximately half of the amount of the radiation that they were emitting shortly after the disaster. According to Jim Smith and Nick Beresford, two prominent radioecologists working in the zone, the vast majority of radionuclides released during the accident had very short half-lives, which meant that 
the amount of radioactivity in the environment declined sharply in the weeks and months following. Only 2% of the radioactivity originally released remained in the environment one year after the accident, and 10 years later, only 1% remained. But these figures are deceptive. This does not necessarily map on to the ongoing harms caused by small amounts of radiation, nor does it account for the uneven distribution of these radionuclides and their ongoing movement throughout the environment, which is not a stable thing. As the anthropologist Joseph Masco notes, nuclear landscapes are often impossible to entirely remediate or return to pre-nuclear conditions. Combined with the tendency for governments to designate such sites as protected nature reserves, this leads to the development of what Masco terms mutant ecologies, which emerge in the aftermath of nuclear tests and accidents and waste disposal sites. So we see this exact process going on at Chernobyl, where in 1988, the Belarusians declared this site um, a protected area called the Pelesi State Radioecological Reserve. And then later in 2016, the Ukrainians declared their part of the zone, the Chernobyl Radiation and Environmental Biosphere Reserve. In such spaces, even though the type of contamination varies, it changes over time, and it can be relatively small in comparison to what was originally released into the environment, the nuclear signature of nuclear reserves could, according to Masco, could change the biological structure of plants and animals over time, making the deep future of the radioactive wildlife preserve as a naturally and socially valued space an open question. So whilst the zone today stands as a memorial to the Chernobyl heroes and firefighters that prevented the disaster from being worse than it was, as well as those who were evacuated from the villages and towns throughout the zone, Chernobyl has also become famous for its nature. For many, the zone is now an iconic vision of European wilderness, an example of how nature can flourish when human activity ceases. But the story is not is quite as simple as that. As you can see here, these news articles, which came out within five years of each other, depict nature in the zone in drastically different ways. Both are also published in the BBC, so this is kind of mainstream, mainstream press. So on the left, we see that the zone is depicted as a radioactive wildlife reserve to which mammals have returned, whilst on the right we see it depicted as a contaminated wasteland in decline. And you can also see this in more formal research outputs like the um, public face and academic website, The Conversation. So two, two different researchers here giving two kind of um, count counteracting opinions on the state of nature in the zone, again published around the same time. Online news sources, as you might imagine, are filled with stories about Chernobyl nature. I remember when I was young, before I ever thought about studying geography or nature at Chernobyl, um, being amazed by these videos of headless moose running through the zone or other weird creatures like giant catfish that had been sighted by tourists and others coming at this from um, Chernobyl films that um, really play up to this idea of the mutant. Whilst the headless moose is most likely to be fake, the catfish are very real. Their size can even be described as natural. This is just how big they grow when they are not caught by fishermen, which happened in the zone when they were left to grow and grow and grow undisturbed. Here's just some more headlines that grab attention um, of viewers concerning Chernobyl. You can see these uh, mutant firebugs here in the middle. Uh, they're actually one of my kind of favorite ways to talk about Chernobyl because every time you go there, you can find these you know, stained back patterns. And everywhere else in Ukraine, they're just about starting to come out now. Um, you see them covering the bottoms of trees, and I've never seen a pattern like this anywhere apart from in the zone. And we also see that these spectacular images of nature don't just circulate in the media, but have also made their way into the actual zone itself. Here you can see the mural that currently sits on the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, which depicts some Shravalsky's horses, which are a critically endangered species of wild horse from Mongolia that were intentionally released into the zone. For those of you who know Askanyanova, the biosphere reserve in Kherson Oblast, the Shavalsky's horses are bred there and brought to the zone as part of a rewilding project, which was at one time connected to the organization Rewilding Europe. The zone can be thought of as a form of accidental rewilding or to borrow from science fiction, an involuntary park, even though these horses um, were intentionally released. Also, we can see throughout Pripyat, which was the main city that was abandoned during the um, evacuation, graffiti artists have uh, painted murals of iconic species throughout the abandoned city, including this one of a wolf, which is kind of hidden, especially during summer when the vegetation is thick. We can also see images of storks leaving their nests painted on the museum inside the zone, which symbolizes their dispersal following the uh, nuclear accident, as storks tend to live within reach of humans scavenging for food. 
perhaps one of the few animals aside from agricultural animals to depart with humans are the storks. From these images, especially the officially sanctioned mural of the horses on the reactor, we can see that nature, wildlife and ecology in general have become politicized at Chernobyl and the health of the zone's wildlife comes to signify the resilience of ecological systems to human impacts, especially those of nuclear power and the nuclear industry. How bad can nuclear contamination be if, if we have these wonderful rare horses running around? If we have these wonderful flowers growing right beside the reactor, nuclear power can't be that bad for biological systems, including humans, right? So these are, these are the kind of questions um, and messages that are coded into nature, which comes to speak for and on behalf of the nuclear industry in general. So from the outset, it becomes clear that we are not just talking about a normal scientific controversy of whether or how nature is affected by nature, but rather one that is shaped by very specific power dynamics concerning nuclear power and industries. Finally, here's a few more uh, examples of how nature at Chernobyl has been described and represented to the Western public. We can see a famous fisherman fishing for giant fish in the Pripyat River, David Attenborough, um, the, the, the catfish was on a few slides back. Um, we can see David Attenborough discussing how nature will recover if only we give it the chance to do so. Uh, we can see this German YouTuber who is particularly fond of eating fruit that grows in the zone to prove to the viewer that everything is fine and normal there. In the top right, in the Chernobyl Museum in Kiev, uh, this mutated pig fetus can be found on display, offering a spectacular representation of how radiation affects living organisms. And last, we can also see this product that is being developed by one of the main scientists at Chernobyl, who favors the thesis that nature is thriving there. This atomic vodka, which is, is now um, a grain spirit because of some Ukrainian um, laws concerning the production and co contents of vodka, is made from crops grown inside the zone to signal that the land is healthy. But I want to come back to this original juxtaposition between wasteland and nature reserve and try and explain where this opposition comes from to do this, I have to look into the science that takes place in the zone, which is largely in the field known as radioecology. So radioecology is a branch of ecology that studies the distribution of isotope, radioactive isotopes in Earth's ecosystems. Anders Moller and Timothy Mousseau, two scientists prominent in the field, or perhaps prominent in radiobiology rather than radioecology, which is an argument that I'm gonna come back to later, trace the history of the discipline back to a cluster of Nobel Prize winners in Paris at the beginning of the 20th century. These people include Henri Becquerel, Marie Curie, Pierre Curie, and Hermann Joseph Muller. These scholars mainly devise theories about what radiation is and what its uses might be both medicinally and commercially. It was mainly Muller who began to specialize in the genetic effects of radiation for which he won his Nobel Prize. From 1945 onwards, when nuclear weapons testing began, the field of radioecology as we know it today began to emerge. The fantastic work of cultural geographer Elizabeth DeLowry has shown how theories of ecology, ecosystems, and systems theory actually arose in relation to the original nuclear weapons testing in New Mexico and Micronesia. Focusing on the work of Eugene and Howard Odom, Eugene um, Odom actually being known as by some as the, the father of modern ecology, um, DeLowry shows how weapons testing by the Atomic Energy Commission in the American colonies of Micronesia led to the idea that islands can be considered separated and isolated biological communities. This myth of, myth of island isolates, as Delauri calls it, allows, allowed for the ecologies and community of islands, such as the Marshall Islands, to become experimental sites or natural laboratories for the newly developing field of modern ecology, where studies of radiation on the environment, plants, animals, and people could be carried out as a form of nuclear imperialism, in the words of Becky, uh, geographer Becky Alexis Martin. In conceptualizing islands as isolated and separate from the rest of the world, they become sites of experiment. And as geographers Becky Alexis Martin and Tom Davies note, the geographical framing of the zone is a socially and politically constructed spatial category, which must be marked by humans given the imperceptibility of radiation. Perhaps we can consider the zone then itself as a kind of island. As nuclear power plant production proliferated around the world from the 1950s, reaching a peak in the early 2000s, it became important to understand how radioactive materials interact with various ecosystems in order to prevent or minimize potential damages. The Journal of Environmental Radioactivity was launched in 1984 and was closely associated with such tasks. As an area of research, radioecology's popularity significantly increased after the Chernobyl catastrophe, and today the discipline is closely associated with radiological protection. Today then, radioecologists are engaged in fieldwork at various radioactive sites around the world from Ukraine, Ukraine to Japan to Russia, in India, the USA, the Marshall Islands, and, and on and on. 
Not all of these sites are contaminated by radiation from nuclear accidents, testing or waste disposal though, but some like Ramsar in Iran are naturally radioactive to levels 10 times what is permissible by international standards for artificial exposure. So radioecological work involves determining the concentrations of radionuclides in the environment, understanding their methods of introduction, outlining the mechanisms by which they transfer between ecosystems. Um, and so broadly, it's, it's about where is it, how did it get there, and how does it move? Radioecologists evaluate the effects of both natural and artificial radioactivity on the environment itself, as well as on the human body, by conducting field sampling, experimental field and laboratory procedures, and developing simulation models. As radioactive materials transfer between all of Earth's major biomes, radioecology is organized into three major subdivisions, land environments, oceanic aquatic environments, and non-oceanic aquatic environments. So the discipline more broadly draws from physics, chemistry, mathematics, biology, and ecology. And as I mentioned earlier, is often concerned with radiation protection and other practical applications. These studies provide the necessary data for dose estimation and risk assessment regarding radioactive pollution and its effects on human and environmental health. In many countries, as of relatively recently, it's compulsory to protect the environment in its own right, independent from humans from the harmful effects of radiation. So lots of new studies have attempted to devise techniques and tools for measuring how radiation moves through and affects natural systems. So uh, on to Chernobyl then, and the first concern of my PhD. Is nature flourishing or perishing in the zone? What does radioecology have to say about this? And later, is radioecology the only voice we should be listening to here? The first one at the top here is a kind of trick question because I'm not really interested in it and I'm not really setting out to answer it. First of all, I'm not a trained natural scientist. I'm not a biologist, a physicist, a chemist or an ecologist. I'm a cultural geographer and my interests lie in the more than human world or the relations between humans, animals, materials, technologies and other non-humans. So really what I'm asking here is not about whether nature is thriving or perishing, but rather how it's come to be understood as both simultaneously. My fieldwork then has invoked, uh, involved extensive ethnographic work with scientists in the zone, Ukrainian and international ones. And as I mentioned um, before, has taken place only in, in Ukraine. I wanted to visit Belarus, but the pandemic has made this difficult. And um, I've also been able to speak to a lot of the Belarusian scientists anyway, um, some of which actually visited Cambridge by kind of chance when I very first started my PhD in, in the second week. So whilst living in Kiev then, I've met, interviewed and visited the zone with all kinds of scientists from microbiologists, agricultural scientists, physicists and even astronomers. I first visited the zone in June 2019 and followed around one of the leading scientists from America who has published extensively on nature at Chernobyl. Here you can see this makeshift laboratory inside an abandoned house that I was working at, which was a fully functioning facilities. This house is located on Lenin Street, which runs up to the checkpoint to the 10 kilometer zone where the power plant is located. And it's also a few houses down the road from Dr. Sergei Gashak, um, from uh, Gashak's laboratory, who is the most prominent field biologist to work in Chernobyl on the Ukrainian side, arguably. For the purposes of time here, I'm only going to outline some of the key papers, highlight some of the tensions that exist in radioecology, and then go into more detail um, around a recent experiment that sought to solve some of these tensions. There are broadly two groups of scientists in the zone who disagree with each other. Those who think that the effects of radiation in the ecosystem of Chernobyl continues to have negative consequences for animals and wildlife, and those that think Chernobyl is an excellent habitat for wildlife. So on the left here, the Chernobyl Forum report published by the International Atomic Energy Agency in 2006 concluded that populations of many plants and animals have expanded and the present environmental conditions have had a positive impact on the biota in the Chernobyl exclusion zone. In a paper published in 2016 in the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, the authors Anders Muller and Tim Musso challenged this opinion. They write that the findings of their own field studies in the zone challenge reports in the popular media and the conclusions of the Chernobyl Forum report and are of relevance today given recent interest in returning contaminated lands to agricultural use and the renaissance of the global nuclear power industry. For Musso and Muller, the Chernobyl Forum report was based on, and I'm, I'm quoting them here, was based on limited information from the Western peer-reviewed scientific literature. This imp implies a, a lack of fieldwork by the authors of this report. In contrast, however, Muller and Musso have conducted fieldwork on dozens of species in the zone, from spiders to bees to grasshoppers, a range of raptors and other birds, microbes and other things. Most notable though, um, I would say, has been their work on barn swallows. 
Anders Muller has conducted extremely extensive work on barn swallows since 1970, attaching rings to the legs of several thousand birds over the course of his career. He's a leading expert on the species and trained as a biologist and zoologist. But what does this pos positive impact even mean? What does abundance mean? Um, so along with Tim Rousseau, an evolutionary biologist, Mola and a range of their graduate students and colleagues have done extensive field work at Chernobyl beginning in the year 2000. When I accompanied them to the zone, I helped to measure a ring and take a, a range of samples from barn swallows, as you can see in the pictures on the left here. I also conducted acoustic bird count surveys throughout the zone, following Anders as he listened to bird calls echo around Pripyat at 6am in the morning, identifying and counting them by ear, which was extremely impressive to me as someone with only basic bird watching abilities. Mola and Mousseau have written extensively on the effects of radiation on barn swallows, finding effects that include beak deformities, albinism, which is small white spots on the feathers, smaller brain sizes, as well as germline effects in their sperm, which means that mutations are passed down through generations. Um, and I recall here Masco's idea of mutant ecologies, which was mentioned earlier. They have also suggested that the zone might be a sink for barn swallows, meaning that the population we see there isn't able to sustain itself. And I'm going to come back to this point in a moment. Like me, the historian Kate Brown also conducted fieldwork in the zone with Mola and Rousseau, as she learned to read the more than human landscape of Chernobyl for signs of disturbance. For Brown, the work of Mola and Rousseau is different to that of most Western scientists conducting Chernobyl nature research. Like the pair themselves know in the paper I just mentioned, Brown points out that a lot of influential Chernobyl studies took place in laboratories around the world and still take place in laboratories around the world using simulations and controlled conditions. In contrast, Mola and Rousseau are interested in the effects of man-made radiation on free roaming wild organisms. Brown's account of fieldwork with Tim and Anders is fascinating, resonating strongly with my own. As she accompanied them, like me, she gained a certain literacy or ability to read the landscape. For instance, she recounts noticing that in certain areas, the forest does not smell like a forest. Looking around, she noticed the dry brown leaves on the floor, much like myself, that were piling up and not rotting or decaying like they normally do. Both of us learned that this piled up leaf litter was not decaying because the creatures that instigate these decaying processes, such as microbes, worms, and other insects, are either absent from the area or are unable to work well in areas with high levels of radioactive contamination. So instead, the leaves just accumulate on the floor year after year. So I'm very aware that um, Professor Brown most likely got a similar to the one I did from um, Mousseau. So it's imp important to think here, yeah, the reason behind this piling up of leaflet or leaflet are in a bit more detail, so as to kind of narrate, narrate it from more than one perspective. So often any abnormalities in nature at Chernobyl are put down to the effects of radiation. Muller and Musso themselves are both criticized by others in the radioecological community for being quick to relate any sign of abnormality to radiation when a whole host of other factors are at play. Here then, others have suggested to me in the field that the absence of microbes in the leaf litter is not due to radiation necessarily, but rather because a large layer of the topsoil was scraped away during the cleanup operations in 1986, removing many of the organisms that lived there that have since not recovered. So being completely honest, it's not exactly clear which version is true to me, probably a bit of both. However, Brown later wrote an, an article in 2021 that raised some deeper concerns that had been mentioned to me by a range of scientists during my fieldwork. Responding to a prominent Chernobyl scientist who wrote a scathing criticism of her book on the Chernobyl disaster, Manual, Survival, Manual for Survival, which was um, up on the screen here earlier, which I do recommend. I think it's a fantastic piece of historical, anthropological, and um, maybe even geographical scholarship. And in it, Brown, um, Brown notes in this response to the criticism of the book that Chernobyl scientist, so scientists receive funds from the nuclear industry, some of them. She, on the other hand, along with Mola and Mousseau, do not, which really got me thinking. Without the time to go into this in massive detail, Brown's comment on funding source prompted me and a colleague with whom I visited the zone in 2019 to try to work out whether funding source affected the outcome of Chernobyl science studies. We're in the process of writing up a project testing the hypothesis that funding source affects results with some interesting preliminary, preliminary results that link funders to nature effects in curious ways. Brown's work clearly raises the political and economic issues that infiltrate and affect science, which she explores in great depth in her book in relation to the human health effects of the Chernobyl disaster. 
Adriana Petrina's work on biological citizenship is also very good in this regard, attending to the ways in which people negotiated their relationship with science and the newly founded Ukrainian state following the Chernobyl nuclear disaster and the collapse of the Soviet Union. So to come to a brief conclusion here, there may be a couple of factors explaining the polarized science in the zone, the most notable potentially being the difference between lab and field studies. And I want to turn to this in a little more detail now to explain what I mean. As I noted earlier, Mola and Mousseau may be considered radiobiologists rather than radioecologists. Their studies, as myself and uh, Brown have observed, involve perfecting the arts of noticing, a term coined by anthropologist Anat Singh. What is this distinction I'm proposing then here between radiobiology and radioecology? Well, radiobiology or radiation biology is a field of clinical and medical sciences involving the effects of ionizing, ionizing radiation. This is simply radiation, which is the capacity to remove electrons from atoms, creating free radicals that then um, cause disturbance and uh, negative effects throughout the body. Um, so radiobiology in this sense is, is largely being concerned with medicine and studying the effects of ionizing radiation on living things. The field's largely concerned with health effects in humans, as well as radiation treatments for cancers and other illnesses. However, I'm proposing here tentatively that we might think of field radiobiology as a, as a particular way of studying the effects of radiation on wild or free roaming organisms. Whereas radioecology is largely concerned with dose estimations and modeling the effects of such doses on animals and wildlife, radiobiology, as Tim Mousseau told me, is concerned with the biological endpoints of radiation in the ecosystem. In other words, how are the effects of radiation expressed in organisms? Radioecology is nominally interested in this too, but has done far less work than those operating under what might be termed field radiobiology. To paint a broad picture, and this is something I'm still working through in my, in my thesis, so um, please forgive me if this is a generalization. Radioecologists are often rooted in the scientific discipline of physics. They are experts at dosimetry and measuring where radioisotopes are and how they move through ecosystems. We can see this logic expressed in the work of Valery Kasparov at the Ukrainian Academy of Agricultural Sciences, who has paid intense detail to the transfer of radionuclides from soil to plants to animals and to humans, and evaluated specific calculations for how much radiation may be permissibly registered in a product. Ukraine actually has the most diverse rules for this, um, with different permissible levels for bread, milk, meat, berries, mushrooms, and on and on, whereas most countries have just a standard measure for, say, meat and milk. Whilst radioecologists may be experts at dosimetry, as previously mentioned, they have studied the impacts of radiation on wild organisms in relatively less depth in the field. On the other hand, radiobiologists such as Mousseau and Muller are accused of inadequate skills in dosimetry or measuring and calculating the dose rates and the, and the radiation exposure of wild animals in the field without full accuracy. So this, this is the main critique leveled at their work. But again, as Brown points out, they have great expertise in biology, genetics, and evolution. So there's a bit of a mismatch going on between the expertise of each group, with radioecologists being good at measuring radiation, but not necessarily the effects of it in organisms, and radiobiologists being good at looking for the effects, but not necessarily at measuring dose. Again, slight gen generalization. A couple of other critiques have been raised concerning field studies at Chernobyl. It's important to recognize that the zone is very unevenly contaminated, like we saw on the maps earlier. So the location of each study really matters and should be disclosed so that the relevant conclusions can be made and others can go and test, test these results. Those in the most contaminated parts like the Red Forest, which is a, a patch of the zone that's not actually counted as the biosphere reserve just um, next to the reactor, um, is, is, is very, it's very contaminated, but it's relatively small compa compared to the zone at large. And so it can't, studies that cannot always be used to speak on behalf of the entire territory. And finally, before I start to move on, there are lots of uncertainties concerning the models used to estimate the effects of low doses of radiation that I can't, I can't get into massively here, but basically the effect of very low doses, which is what much of the wildlife in Chernobyl now experiences, have been understudied and the current model, models in radiation protection and radioecology are constantly being reshaped as this research continues. As such, we have a situation where physicists and biologists have been producing knowledge on the health of nature in the zone, but that their divergent responses can be explained by their different methods, approaches, and lines of questioning, with radioecologists focusing on the distribution and transfer of radionuclides through the ecosystem, and radiobiologists focusing on, focusing on biological endpoints. These differences lead to drastically different interpretations of the health of Chernobyl's environment. 
For instance, many of the radioecology researchers suggest that human presence is far worse for wildlife than radiation is, whereas radiobiologists pay more attention to individual animals and other wildlife and the effects on species. The former notion here was encapsulated when the famous philosopher and environmentalist James Lovelock suggested that putting nuclear waste inside nature reserves was a good idea if we are to foster the conservation of threatened ecosystems because it would deter um, humans from certain land uses. The idea that human presence is worse than radiation is problematic though, especially in a landscape that's filled with anthropogenic contaminants. How do you say that human presence is there or not? It's certain kinds of human pres presences and absences and the way the land is used that really matter here, not necessarily whether um, human bodies per se are there. Again, this is my early theorization of how they come to such different results and I'm drawing some generalizations. So I'm gonna point out that there's many who are now working hard to bridge this gap, including Jermaine Oriozola, Mike Wood, Sergei Gasha, Catherine Rains, and many, many, many more in the UK, the US, Ukraine, Belarus, and Japan, amongst other countries. An interdisciplinary approach is clearly necessary though, if this scientific controversy is to be solved. I want to focus here on one specific example of how this gap in the criticisms that have been leveled at each group of scientists is trying to be bridged. So now I'm moving into the second chapter of my thesis, focusing on wolves in the Belarusian side of the zone. First, I'm going to give a brief outline of why I chose to study wolves and then talk about the research in question. In 2015, a team of researchers published a journal article showing that there were seven times more wolves inside the zone than in the surrounding uncontaminated areas. The abundance of wolves at Chernobyl has since been used to signal the overall health of Chernobyl's ecosystem. As the logic goes, if top predators or keystone species like wolves are abundant, then the trophic levels beneath them must be thriving too. This, this is a, um, a conclusion come to from studies in Yellowstone National Park in um, America. So wolves have also garnered a lot of popular attention to featuring in the 2011 PBS documentary, Radioactive Wolves, which we can see here on the screen. In 2018, a young male wolf was tracked leaving the Chernobyl exclusion zone from Belarus and moving into Russia. The media were quick to react with alarming reports that radioactive mutants were spreading mutant genes from Chernobyl into Europe. This suspected dispersal event where a young animal leaves its home range to find new mates and breed was very significant for many people in the Chernobyl science community. This was the first wolf track leaving the zone ever, um, as far as everyone's aware. And because it was caught and tagged when it was young, it suggests that young wildlife is born in the zone and moves outwards. This is significant because there have been questions raised about whether Chernobyl is a source or a sink of wildlife, as I touched upon earlier. Basically, this means, does wildlife come to the zone because of surrounding pressures to die, which explains the high which can explain high populations and also the hypotheses of decline? Or is new wildlife born inside the zone contributing to the overall region's population? This event points to the latter, this dispersal event, um, that Chernobyl is actually a source of the wolf population in the region. These source sink dynamics allow for certain conclusions to be drawn in relation to large mammals and wide ranging animals. For such creatures, the zone seems to provide an ideal habitat, so much so that their numbers are increasing there. Even in the most contaminated areas where um, often these wolves were found to dwell. But this does not mean that other animals in other more contaminated areas, especially those with lower mobilities than wolves, are not affected. Things like insects, which have very small territories, for instance, are exposed to much higher levels of radiation. But on the other hand, um, they tend to be um, less sensitive to it. The lesson here is then that depending on what, which species you focus on, you might find different results. It's difficult to speak of nature or animals in general, something th the philosopher Jacques Derrida made clear many years ago. The zone straddles the border of Ukraine and Belarus, and the research in question was actually carried out in the Belarusian portion of the zone. In 2015, according to one of the leading wolf researchers in Belarus, Dr. Vadim Sidorovich, to date there are between 800 and 1,200 wolves during early winter and between 600 and 800 are killed each year. Wolves face persecution on the border of the zone where some villagers are paid to hunt them. What I'm mainly concerned with here though is not just the sourcing dynamics and how they allow us to reflect on nature at Chernobyl, but the ways in which a team of researchers went about attempting to solve the scientific controversy in the zone by developing a novel piece of technology. In 2015, a team of ecologists based largely at the Savannah River Ecology Laboratory at the University of Georgia in the United States, as well as the Institute of Radio Protection and Nuclear Safety in France, 
published a paper in the Journal of Environmental Radioactivity detailing the development of a new device they hoped would allow them to advance field studies in radioecology. The team was composed of a variety of ecologists, including radioecologists, landscape ecologists, and more specifically, movement ecologists. As the researchers note, difficulties in quantifying the time animals dwell in particular locations across heterogeneously contaminated landscapes pose great problems when trying to accurately measure or reconstruct external exposure and dose effect relationships. Such uncertainties prompted the team to develop a new instrument by merging two existing technologies. This instrument called a GPS dosimeter can be seen here on the left of the screen. This is the exact model made by Vectronic Aerospace um, in collaboration with the researchers. Um, and it combines GPS telemetry with dosimetry as its name suggests. Specifically, it quantifies the spatial and temporal variations in external dose to which wildlife are exposed. According to the team, the GPS dosimeter can produce novel information that has been challenging to collect historically from free ranging animals in their natural environments. An important application of the GPS dosimeter is that it will enable researchers to understand the relationship of animals to their contaminated habitats and better assess animal responses to radiation stress. That was um, caught in the researchers themselves. And so you can see here a, um, a camera trap photo of a wolf wearing the GPS dosimeter provided by uh, Nick Beresford at the Tree Project. And you can see uh, one scientist attaching the collar to a wolf at the bottom. And basically this allows the researchers to paint a really detailed picture of contamination exposure as the animals move throughout the environment. Previously, what would happen was they'd catch a wolf like this. Uh, you can see on the bottom picture there, take a sample from the soil and ambient background radiation reading. Um, and that's what they'd assume that it was exposed to. And that's what they'd then extrapolate to determine its exposure throughout its lifetime. And as you can imagine, if you're in a hotspot here, um, that's, it's just not gonna be accurate. So these um, collars, they work by recording the location and radiation exposure every 35 minutes, sending this information to a satellite, which then sends on the data to the researchers via email, wherever they are in the world. The collars are programmable in terms of their drop-off date to avoid the need for recapture. A, mechan a mechanical pin controls this process, which the researchers set for six months from the capture day. This timing was chosen to allow the wolves to be tracked for as long as possible, taking into account battery limitations. The team successfully trapped nine wolves inside the Belarusian part of the zone and fitted them with GPS dosimeters. One animal was found dead within five days of capture, so the data was excluded from the analysis. Their research demonstrated in field conditions the heter heterogeneity of exposure as wolves moved through the zone. As they note in their paper, there is tremendous spatial and temporal variation among the eight wolves. In other words, a single animal is exposed to quite a bit of variation as it moves around its environment. Interestingly, and again, quoting one of the researchers, radiation levels didn't actually come out as a significant influencing factor on where wolves were distributed or where they were present within the exclusion zone. But they didn't find too much influence of any other habitat variables either. Because they're highly mobile, they're walking tens of kilometers every day, and their home ranges are so large, it seems that they are able to use almost all of the habitats within the zone. Basically, they don't avoid hotspots. In their study then, the researchers were able to test one of the core assumptions involved in the environmental radiation risk assessments, namely that mean, environment, mean um, contaminant concentrations conservatively estimate external exposures. In other words, the current models overestimate external exposure. Sorry, sorry, the, the current models underestimate um, external exposure. Their findings suggested that these risk assessments on average actually, therefore, um, um, yeah, so the, these risk assessments on average actually underestimate the exposure received by wild animals in contaminated environments. And as one researcher told me, one of these conservative assumptions involves using the average contaminant levels. And when we did that, lo and behold, five of the eight animals had doses higher than those conservative numbers. So that approach is not as protective as we originally thought it was. That approach is used throughout many contaminant scenarios that go beyond just radiation exposure. So the research ended up having broader implications than just radioecology. It's important to emphasize though, that even though they found out that the um, models that we're using were um, perhaps underestimating the exposure received by wild animals, the doses are still low. So the team remained confident that the animals are not being threatened. However, this technology was able to gain data on the exposure of wolves to radioactivity in field conditions, which really advanced um, these lab the traditionally laboratory-based models and testing. 
But again, as I mentioned earlier, the effects of low dose are highly debated in the radio ecology community. And so even still, there's, there's still lots to be found out here. So whilst work remains to be done in this area, and the study did not specifically look at how the wolves were affected by the radiation, simply the dose, um, further research is needed to understand how species, including more um, smaller species and larger species, uh, respond to these different doses as they move through the zone. Um, this will involve more biological sampling of wild and free roaming animals and other, um, other sampling concerning wildlife health. So I think some of this work is now ongoing in the Fukushima exclusion zone with animals like wild boar, where these same collars have been deployed to test these assumptions further. I'm now briefly going to turn to the last part of the wolf's story, which links back to the representations of nature in the zone um, that I started with. In a few lines highlighted here on page four of their paper published in the European Journal of Wildlife Research, the wolf researchers know that the spread of radiation-induced genetic mutations to populations in uncontaminated areas could be possible as the wolf left the zone and dispersed into the surrounding environment. This idea of the spread of mutant genes was quickly picked up by the popular media, who were quick to raise the alarm that wildlife from Chernobyl could pose threats to biological communities outside the zone. In this way, the wolf leaving the zone was framed as a biosecurity threat in a similar way to the way humans were um, that were evacuated from the zone back in 1986. So whilst inside the zone, wolves were represented as signs of ecosystem flourishing, but when they cross the border, they become threats to the genetic purity of neighboring European wolf populations, apparently. So we see then how the science in the zone travels into the popular media and may have impact on this species, which is hunted in the surrounding area. But for me, this example allows um, geographers to think about the methods, methods with which scientists attempt to understand the relationship between organisms and their environment, but also how we think about this relationship more generally in terms of how a landscape, a landscape inscribes itself materially and semiotically into moving animal bodies. I take this theoretical question up in more detail in my thesis, as it has long been a central concern of geographers, but now I'm going to briefly um, move on to discuss the last two chapters of my thesis. So, what I've talked about so far has largely been about science, and this is only one way out of many that we can come to understand nature in the zone. Understanding the effect of radiation on nature can only get us so far in knowing what life looks like and how it's experienced for animals and humans. It also risks painting a homogenous picture of the zone as either this wasteland or this nature reserve, whilst on the ground, everyday life may look more mundane and radiation in nature might be experienced in much more domestic or unspectacular ways. In my research, I wanted to know how people in the zone come to experience various aspects of nature, so I turned to those living with dogs. People live with many animals in the zone, including cows, chickens, and other farm animals. There's even what was described to me as a small zoo, which I visited. But dogs are often seen as not really being part of nature by people in general. They're seen as too tame for the wild. Following geographer Krithika Srinivasan, however, we can think of dogs as being part of nature where nature is not something that must be disconnected from humans or something that is necessarily wild or independent from us. So, the dogs themselves then, what, what is their story? So during the evacuation in 1986, evacuees were instructed to leave their pets behind on the premise that they'd return within a few days. As such, many set out enough food to sustain their companion animals during their absence, but the promise of return was quickly revoked and later, as gloomily depicted in the 2019 HBO television series Chernobyl, Soviet soldiers were sent to kill any remaining pets for fears they would spread radioactive contamination outside the zone. You can see that here in the bottom picture. Today, around 550 dogs roam the zone and surrounding areas, many of whom are likely descendants of the originally abandoned pets and survivors of the attempted cull, although this is not known for sure due to a lack of um, genetic testing. As the story goes, the remaining dogs were left to fend for themselves, going feral and then wild, and have since been driven out of the wilderness by predators, mainly wolves, um, and a lack of food and water towards places where humans work and dwell in the zone. The zone's administration originally viewed the dogs as vectors for the spread of rabies from wild animals to power plant workers, and as such, they hired an employee to kill the dogs, but this person sub subsequently refused to do so, according to the Clean Futures Fund which is a US non-governmental organization that cares for the dogs and humans living, living with Chernobyl's toxic legacy. And you can see the banner of their project here on the top of the screen. The dogs are also the subject of a management campaign by this same NGO and their partners, SPCA International. 
The CFF's website suggests the dogs are malnourished and are in dire need of medical attention. And this kind of picture here really sums up the kind of um, story that they're trying to tell there. To manage their overpopulation between, I say overpopulation in uh, quotation marks, between 2017 and 2019, the CFF conducted spay neuter programs with a team of international volunteers, which consisted of veterinarians, veterinary technicians, dog catchers, and others, and managed to bring the population down from over 1,000 to around 550 dogs. They also facilitate the adoption of dogs from the zone to the US and Canada. Many dogs are also tourist attractions in their own right, gaining large followings on social media, platforms like Instagram and Twitter. You might have heard of Tarzan, the dog that lives at this big Dugar radar. Um, very popular dog with tourists and my parents actually. Um, the dogs are represented in various ways by different groups from feral radioactive mutants to homeless and vulnerable domestic pets in need of surviving from contamination. So during the, the COVID-19 quarantine, the dogs were even live streamed to paying customers via, via Airbnb experiences as tourists could not visit the zone. They're also the subject of numerous documentaries, including um, my own film project, which I'm working on with Ukrainian director, producer, and designer. Like other animals in the zone, the dogs attract widespread fascination from curious publics keen to witness mutant survivors of the apocalypse. The charisma of Chernobyl's animals is undoubtedly entwined with the zone's landscape and vice versa. Unlike other non-human animals in the zone, however, the dogs attract specific attention due to their entangled histories with humans in the area. As domesticated animals, they attract a sympathy perhaps not afforded to wild animals, partly because most of them can be directly encountered, sometimes by petting, most certainly by sight. In Mary Mycio's book, Wormwood Forest, passing mention is made of the dogs that attach themselves to the border checkpoints throughout the zone. Her unwillingness to engage with them as part of the zone's nature, which is the focus of her book, is a shame, I think. However, dogs do not just attach themselves to checkpoints, but also to people working there. Usually from two to five checkpoint guards work at each checkpoint at any one time according to a shift-based schedule. These workers have often established close relationships with the dogs and therefore know them better than anyone else. The CFF even aims to protect this relationship between the dogs and workers. Despite this, however, the guards' own perspectives are missing from narrations of the dogs' lives and popular representations. Because of this, I decided to conduct a participatory photo project with the guards to gain their perspectives into life in the zone with their non-human companions. I spent a summer in the zone with the Clean Futures Fund, observing and participating in their work in the clinic and the field, catching and caring for dogs. However, I've not yet, I've not yet fully analysed the data, so I'm going to talk mainly here about my work with the checkpoint guards. Inspired by the geographer Tom Davies, who did his PhD fieldwork in Ivankiv and other regions surrounding the Chernobyl exclusion zone, using participatory methods with um, local people, uh, in May last year, I sent five disposable cameras to Chernobyl from Kiev. Four were given to guards working at checkpoints, Lelive, Benivka, Pripyat, and Parashiv, and one to someone working in a convenience shop for workers. They all received a letter outlining the project with brief descriptions, prompting them to take photographs of their everyday lives with the dogs, where the dogs lived, what they ate, and where they went, and anything else the participants found interesting. After two months, I conducted follow-up semi-structured interviews with the individuals who took the photographs, um, with a translator. I'm not going to turn to the findings of this. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm now going to turn to, to some of the findings of this project. Despite the liminal status of the dogs as partly or collectively owned by um, guards and others in, inside the zone, most of them are still afforded care at the checkpoints. At Pripyat, the favorite photog photograph of one guard depicted feeding time. As you can see here, the dogs are feasting on a meal of borscht and other leftovers from the canteen. You can see the top left one with the red beetroot inside. The dogs are fed typical Ukrainian staples such as salad, buckwheat, bread, kasha, salo, and sausages by the guards. Most of the dogs were also afforded some kind of shelter. A guard at the leave checkpoint told me, I made a house with pasha for the dogs to have a place to hide from the snow and rain. They sleep there together. Human dog relations are not universal between guards and dogs though. The nature of shift work at the checkpoint, checkpoints means the dogs encounter different guards at different times. As noted by a guard at Lelive, they run to meet me because they know that I brought them a gift. But there are other people who do not care whether they eat or go hungry, and so the dogs tend to avoid them. For another guard, the dogs are just around for security from trespassers, known as stalkers, and wolves. Um, so security from uh, st stalkers uh, and wolves that can kind of come fairly close to human inhabited areas during the night. 
In this case, uh, a sense of detachment is preserved between the gods and the dogs due to the nature of the shift work, the threat of wolf predation, and the circumstantial nature of the dogs just being there when many of them started working at their checkpoint. For instance, many would say to me when I asked about their origins, where did they come from? They would just say, well, it was just here when I arrived. These factors play into the sense of responsibility felt by some gods towards the dogs, pointing to what anthropologist Mate Candia describes as the symbiotic relationship between engagement and detachment inherent in certain human-animal relations. Here we see that detachment and engagement are not binary categories that signify disregard or care. Rather, they inform each other and are both involved in a careful relationship. For the gods, something resembling a sense of home is co-constituted with the dogs, contesting ideas of the foreign visitors, volunteers and veterinarians who told me that these dogs were homeless or do not belong in the zone. Far from being a wasteland, we see that despite the threat of radiation, human and animal relationships can flourish in these everyday terms when we focus on this ethnographic level. The origin of the dogs is also not fully understood. It's likely though that some, if not many of them, are descendants of pets abandoned during the evacuation of the zone in 1986. In the absence of genetic studies, this is often explained in relation to their behavior, relatively large size, shaggy coats, and the absence of small breeds, specifically, um, um, these are specific characteristics people tend to associate with wildness. And so they, they also think that these characteristics emerged via a sort of natural selection as the dogs were left to fend for themselves over a certain period of time. A survival of the fittest was enacted through the population and, endured, and the dogs endured this for the last three and a half decades of relative isolation. It's also speculated that some dogs crossbred with wolves and other wild canids in the zone. So this one on the right, um, scientists I was with told me expect due to the tail and the color, you can see the color more in the middle picture, this golden color, suspected um, a domestic dog bred with a golden jackal in the zone. Um, so yeah, so um, this notion of wildness really does emerge around the kind of purported origin of the dogs. At the checkpoints though, the, many of the gods were unaware of the origins and um, the, the gods were quick to tell me that often dogs just showed up. Uh, so during my field work, I, I saw some dogs that I'd never seen before. There's often new ones arriving that don't quite fit the kind of stereotypical Chernobyl dog and kind of look out of place. So the, 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 bo the borders of the zone are porous in terms of these dogs. So the population um, is really hard to speak generally about. So these stories demonstrate the trouble with notions of wildness evoked by the history of genetic lineage of the dogs. The porosity of the zone's borders to people and animals, it seems, means that the population is by no means isolated. The territorial practices of the dogs were also frequently mentioned in interviews, invoking their wildness through their potential to be fierce whilst defending their territories and marking space. Those living with, gods, uh, living with dogs disagree about their wildness though. A god at Pripyat asked, why are they wild? They live here, communicate with tourists. At the Dugar radar, they even learned commands from an early age. And these were not trained. If they were wild, they would run and live elsewhere, but they live with us. Here the dogs' territorialities were again invoked, but this time as a sign of their domesticity. For one god, the only difference between dogs in Chernobyl and pet dogs was that here they are free and at home on a stick. Although, as you see here, um, this particular dog was chained to prevent it from running away. One guard at the Benivka checkpoint told me about their dog. She's wild. She can't handle people. You can't even pet her. You just feed her. You should just give her a pan of food and go. She waits until you leave and then she eats. We can't pet her. We can't get rid of her ticks and we can't brush her fur. That's her character. She just barks. For these people, such apparent wildness helps to justify and maintain a sense of detachment from the dogs, which they care for intermittently or at arm's length. There's also a sense that the foreign definitions of Chernobyl dogs as homeless or in need of saving are juxtaposed with the experiences of those living relatively ordinary lives with the dogs in the zone. While certain people and groups suggest the dogs are in need of care, adoption or treatment, in effect that domestic dogs in general don't belong here, the stories of the checkpoint guards' lives with the dogs challenge these notions of who or what belongs. For instance, guards would often suggest that the dogs were unharmed by and adapted to radiation in the landscape. They've already adapted just like us. Everything will be fine, one guard told me. This topic was often met with humour, alluding to the ways in which pollution in toxic landscapes is often normalised to the point at which it vanishes, which actually poses problems for environmental justice and activism, as noted by the anthropologist Vanessa Castan-Brotto. The above points concerning humans and dogs at Chernobyl reflect three things. 
First, they suggest that ignoring the possibility of toxic exposure can become an important means of coping with life in a toxic landscape. Second, they point to the ways in which people navigate toxic landscapes according to uneven cartographies of contamination, where some places are cleaner than others. And third, in comparing human and dog experiences of toxic landscapes, they point to the potential for shared exposures, which reveals this kind of shared animality and this shared sense of being in nature in the zone. For anthropologist Evan Kirksey, forms of chemosociality emerge in polluted environments where altered, attenuated, or augmented relationships accompany chemical exposures. But in some toxic landscapes, altered social relations and practices between species emerge not only due to direct exposure. As I said, these dogs are often living in certain clean spaces that have been well remediated. But chemosociality may also emerge where exposure is potential. Um, yeah, so potential exposure might also give rise to these certain forms of um, human-animal bonding. Nature at Chernobyl, therefore, is made sense of through these shared exposures and through the companionships that are formed in the aftermath of environmental disasters at the everyday level, offering a contrasting vision to what it means to flourish in the zone to that which is offered by science. Focusing here on the lived experience of dogs and humans in the zone has little to do with modelling and measuring exposures, but more to do with people's and animals' everyday realities. So what I've hoped to show here is that making sense of nature in the Chernobyl exclusion zone is a complicated task. The competing ideas about whether Chernobyl is a nature reserve or an apocalyptic wasteland show that nature is not something that is easy to define. If Chernobyl is a nature reserve, it cannot be considered to be pristine and free from the impact of humans, nor can it be considered to be a stable ecosystem as it's constantly undergoing changes, most notably due to forest fires. Nature then emerges as something that is not separate from humanity, but rather something that humans are entangled with and part of, including the materials we release into the environment. Secondly, I've tried to show that when it comes to nature, it's not only scientists who get to say whether a landscape is flourishing or not. In turning to the dogs, we see how people and animals actually live on a day-to-day -day basis in such landscapes. Here, radiation is imagined differently by those who must learn to cope with and negotiate risks that are present in their lives, rather than just something that can be studied, often using methods and everyday techniques that are very different to the high-tech ones used by scientists. So, um, thank you everyone for listening. Um, now gonna stop and take some questions um from those in ukraine i'd be really interested to hear if you had any recommendations of people working on similar cultural geographic topics from ukrainian perspectives um and thank you everyone for coming um Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much. If you um, if you have questions, you may put them in our chat or you may ask them directly by raising your hand. Um, while you are thinking, I'll start with questions we received via our Google Forms. Uh, so um, I think you uh, you answered some of the some of these questions but still um, um, where did the wolf go and um, does the wolf has any progeny so these are questions from our other forms mm -hmm. that's actually it's a really good question because um, the particular wolf that was tracked leaving the zone um, the collar that they used, it stopped working. And then the wolf kind of went offline. And then later the collar started working again. And by this time it was in Russia. So what we have is we have like a solid plot of points moving like this, and you have a gap and it's, it's moved further away. And then we have a gap of a few months and it's now in Russia. So the, the points have been connected like this. Um, so there's, and then, and then it stopped working again. And so no one knows where the wolf ended up. It was never recaptured. The collar was never recovered. Um, so there's no way of knowing whether it had any, um, puppies or whether, what, what its fate was basically. So it's an interesting case, but we don't know. Um, was it she or he? I think it was he because it, it was definitely he, it was a young male wolf, yeah. Yeah, and we also have this question, uh, why have you picked a wolf to observe? 
Um, yeah. I picked um, wolves and dogs because they're both species of canids. Um, so they offer this nice comparison between domestic and wild, but also as a keystone species, um, wolves have been called upon in the scientific literature to signal the, the health of the overall ecosystem kind of down from this cascade of ecological, ecological relationships. And also wolves are just um, very, a very interesting species to study in the context of Europe at the moment where they're returning to many landscapes. Um, so yeah, it's both, it's both an interesting species in its own right in terms of the comparison with dogs and it is called upon frequently to speak on the behalf of nature in general at Chernobyl. Um, I found out the other day actually when I was doing some background research on wolves in Ukraine in the Ukrainian scientific literature that the largest ever wolf recorded male wolf was actually um, killed in Ukraine, which I found crazy. Yeah, that's fascinating. Okay, um, I think Liam um, uh, wants to, to ask a question, so please. Thank you very much. I've got a question around kind of mobility and confinement because mobility seems one of the themes that connects together your different research questions in terms of mobility of contaminants, mo mobility of species, and also mobility of knowledge. And I wonder kind of, do you discuss the kind of the tension of the degree to which this has been tried to be confined? So at various points you can see, you know, both human and non-human mechanisms of confinement to try and stop particular flows from this site to the outside. And I wonder if you could just speak on that kind of tension and relationship between, between the two. Mm. I mean, that, yeah, it's a very, very good point. Um, I think, so in terms of flows, we're talking here about the, the borders of the zone, right? This is the, the, the mobility of crossing borders is largely what we're concerned with. And um, first of all, the, the zone is nuclear zones, as Tom Davies and Becky Alexis Martin suggest, are you know entirely marked by humans. You can't sense radiation, so you, you, they have to be marked by humans. So drawing the drawing the border is is itself like a political social act, as as I'm sure you know. And so what happened throughout history um, is that there's still a lot of resources inside the zone, like wood, berries, mushrooms, etc. And these these things are picked and foraged and, and move across the borders. Um, and Kate Brown's written about how uh, blueberries connect, collected inside the zone are taken out and mixed with um, blueberries picked elsewhere so that the average contamination level drops below permissible standards and, and, and can then be moved around. And so, yeah, so there's the, basically what I'm saying is that things, things are constantly crossing this border um, and are constantly moving, including the radioactive isotopes themselves, which are moving through um, water systems, they're moving through um, plants and trees, they're being set on fire and distributed via the atmosphere again and again. So when it comes to the wolves, I just see this as a kind of extension of those other things that are both intentionally and kind of unintentionally moving. Um, and, and when you think about like confinement of the wolf, I think, you know, it's best to speak about it metaphorically in a sense, because there's nothing physically confining it from leaving, but it's the representation of the wolf that is kind of confined in a way it goes from being a kind of sign of ecosystem health to as soon as it crosses the border to being a mutant that is posing these threats to the outside and then um i guess the the where, where you can think about more confinement specifically would be the dogs where they're kind of the idea that they live these free living like free roaming lifestyles is is being kind of imposed upon or tried to be governed by this American NGO, which does good work, it does it cares for them and stuff. But you know, I tried to show in this presentation that there's the people that live on the ground are actually experiencing lives with the dogs in a very different way that doesn't need to be um, contained in the way that, that they're proposing. And so yeah, yeah, I, I mean it's a it's a very interesting question and I'm going to think about it more, but I see I see it definitely as a key theme emerging um, throughout each of the chapters. So thank you for that. Any more questions? No questions, only I want to say thank you for your research and thank you for your Ukrainian. 
how it impossible so long so big text in ukrainian it was perfect and it was uh, something amazing for me because i never uh, i never heard uh, so beautiful speech from foreigner in ukrainian Thank you. Or, or you, you, you are not Ukrainian, yes? No, no, I'm English. You are English. Yeah. <laughs> you have uh, talent in uh, languages, I think. Oof, I don't know. I, would, I don't think I would say that. You can say thank you to Oksana as well for being my teacher. It's amazing, Oksana. <laughs> uh, this, that's not me. Um, but yeah, the speech was great. Um, we have uh, one more hand uh, from Svetlana. You're welcome. Um, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Jonathan, for such a great presentation, such a great interest in uh, Ukraine and um, Chernobyl exclusion zone in particular. Um, I'm a research fellow at Frankfurt Zoological Society and a PhD student at the University of Freiburg. I don't know, perhaps you have heard from Sergei Gaschak that um, Frankfurt Zoological Society within the um, project Polesia, Wilderness Without Borders, has launched wildlife monitoring in Chernobyl last year. And uh, I have been working there since then. And if nothing change, changes, I will go there next week again. So um, I would like just to ask, did you have uh, recorded, have you recorded any dogs in Teremci on the left bank of the Pripyat River? Uh, could you describe a little bit more detail exactly where that is? Um, it's right uh, in the delta of Pripyat River. It's one of the villages that that is partly abandoned, but there are still people living there and there is a checkpoint. Because we have recorded a dog there and you mm -hmm. haven't mentioned that you had people recording dog pictures at that checkpoint. So just for your information that uh -huh. there is a ca camera trap picture of a dog. Okay, that, that's very, thank you. And, um, uh, yeah, it's very fresh information because we're still collecting data and it has it will be collected um, the last portion, uh, one of the last portions, will be collected this month. So it's just for your information. And there are also cats. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, we have recorded some cats at Leliv mm -hmm. checkpoint, very close, which was a great surprise. One of them looked a bit like wild cat, but still, it was <laughs> it was a domestic cat. Um, and um, I just have. Um, a few, uh, just two questions. Um, uh, why haven't you this? Why haven't you decided to focus on species that are uh, not moving, or at least uh, not moving that far as wolves, as they probably once they are in the highly contaminated zones, they are staying there, unlike wolves or large other large mammals. Mm -hmm. Um, f first, um, with the dogs, I gave the cameras to f uh, four checkpoints and uh, one canteen place that were willing to take it. Some weren't willing to take it, so maybe the one you mentioned didn't didn't want one. Um, but I, I'm, I've been to like many, including like the train station and stuff, where there's dogs. There's dogs basically at every checkpoint. I don't think I've been at any of the checkpoints without dogs. So it's not a surprise that they would, you would catch one in the uh, camera trap there um with cats as well there's like there's a few cats that live domestic ones at different checkpoints which are super cute and i've seen only once like three kittens running around i think they're much rarer um because the dogs eat them wolves eat them and also there's like lynx and other predators in the zone so i think they're just they, they have a much harder time surviving although i know from like um people's reports that there were lots of cats there right after the disaster why did I choose to study um, wolves and dogs? It was I, I followed my fieldwork basically. So I followed I followed what um, what stories were accessible. But if 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 you think about places like the Red Forest and you think about non-moving organisms like plants and microbes, 
I tried to highlight in a presentation, but like plants and microbes and insects and smaller things tend to be less sensitive to radiation than larger mammals. A humans being the most sensitive to radiation out of all um, organisms. And so I think like the, the, there are really interesting questions to be asked around plants and I will touch on it in part in my thesis, um, especially pollinators because pollinators are increasingly becoming a sign of um, used to speak on behalf of the environment, the environment's health in general. And they're also being used at Chernobyl to speak on the behalf of nature in general. Uh, it's also the evolutionary history of plants is really interesting because they were around on earth before humans and existed in at a time of earth's development when radiation levels were much higher. And so they just tend to have this kind of almost like ancient inbuilt capacity to deal with, with radiation in a way that animals don't. Um, so that, that there's many, many interesting conceptual questions there that I'm really interested in. I just didn't have time to kind of paint this picture here where I wanted to show this kind of, it almost works because you've got the two kinds of canids, wolves and dogs, which have these very like easy, easily understandable cultural representations that allow me to kind of convey this message that moves from kind of broad science to actually, well, life, nature, life flourishing doesn't just need to be narrated by scientists. It can be narrated on the everyday level. So that, that's why I chose them. But I'd be, I'd be really interested to hear more about your work because I've spoken to, quite a few people at the uh, Frankf Frankfurt Zoological Society, did you say? Right. Yeah, yeah, um, about the E40 waterway, which I'm working on a project on at the minute mm -hmm. that cuts through the zone. So I, it would be good if you could maybe send me an email or something and we can chat because yeah. I th I'm, I, there's a chance that I'm actually going to go to Chernobyl next week on the, on the, uh, the, desert, on the anniversary. So it might oh. be a good time if you're around. Okay, I'm planning to stay for two weeks and to take care of all the data uh, that have been collected. Um, just one more question regarding wolves. Uh, don't you think that they mainly stay close to humans because otherwise they, they are just killed by wolves? Or similarly in high numbers uh, based on the camera trap footage that we have received? Dogs, you mean? Yes. Dogs stay around humans. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, it's a, so it's a commensal relationship. Kind of islands where humans stay, otherwise they're just gone. Yeah, I, I think that's I think that's true. Um, although from accounts from people who've been in the field for many years, like Denis Vishniewski, um, mm -hmm. he showed me a video, for instance, of like a feral pack of dogs apparently the last feral pack of dogs attacking a wild boar that he caught on camera like grainy footage from like 2010 or something like this and this was kind of um for him the last pack that was like truly independent um so yeah so i think at one point there were dogs that probably before the checkpoints were fully functioning and and, and there permanently there were dogs that were more free roaming fending for themselves and there's no doubt that they still fend for themselves now i've seen like some the, the catch like raccoon dogs sometimes i've seen dead raccoon dogs and i've seen them catching other things and um but yeah it's largely commensal but i think just reducing it to like the food relationship uh for me is not it's not so interesting because when you speak to the guards and you try and watch the dogs as well their relationships are much deeper than that it's about entertainment it's about boredom it's about a genuine care love it's about um you know, experiencing the landscape together. They often, they often accompany guards on like patrol walks. And so like in one of the slides there, actually I didn't say, but the people in the background are stalkers and the dogs were there when the guards found stalkers walking through Pripyat. And then also the, the, there's been a couple of times where trespassers have actually killed dogs. So they've sh the, the, the dogs have barked at them and they've shut them into like um, apartments, abandoned apartments, so that they, they don't make the gods aware of them. And they've also, uh, the gods have told me before that they think they've been poisoned because the, the dogs can kind of, you know, alert the gods to their presence. And so the relationships are much more than just food. Well, there are quite some trespassers and stalkers because we have lost, I think, about 10 camera traps. Mm -hmm. We were taken definitely by humans, not by animals. Mm -hmm. um, just uh, one more point, uh, rather information uh, that 
We had camera traps simultaneously, both in Chernobyl exclusion zone and in one of the national parks in the Capathians, mm -hmm. in the Ukrainian Capathians. And apparently we had way more wolves in Chernobyl. Mm -hmm. We deployed camera traps not for winter and autumn, not uh, um, in the entire reserve because the, the methods and the design didn't allow that, but mainly on the left bank of river uh, of the Pripyat River and partly on the right bank and almost at every camera trap location we had wolves. Uh, the largest pack uh, we had simultaneously uh, on the photos was three, but apparently there are probably more wolves. They were just not captured by the camera mm. trap which I personally found very fascinating as you wouldn't have expect, expected that many wolves in Chernobyl when compared to a national park in the Capathians. Mm -hmm. was, for me, it was a kind of a great, um, great news, but... Yeah, it's definitely, that's what people are using to say that like humans are worse for the environment than radiation is. So it, it, doesn't, it doesn't surprise me that it's just... Um, I, the GPS data as well showed that wolves were moving from the left bank to the right bank, back and forward. They were crossing it, and it's a huge river, and you can see these GPS traces swimming across the river. So that was that was a surprising finding from their research. Okay, I don't have any more questions. Thank you once again, and hopefully we can meet one day. Thanks, I will write my email in the chat. Please, please do. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Svetlana. So we got we got a discussion here, which was I think great. Um, if if anyone has any questions, you're welcome. Please ask. Uh, Jonathan, uh, have you uh, some colleagues in Ukraine in your topic? of research now f fresh research in your topic maybe a little bit the same um well in terms of scientists lots yeah but in terms of more cultural studies people less so um i do i'm aware of some people that are working on landscape ideas around landscape and stuff but i would love to hear from more people who are working on on, on these cultural studies issues. I found it re quite difficult to meet a lot of people. I've met about five who are doing really similar stuff. But if you have any recommendations for authors or students or people doing this stuff, I'd love to hear them. Thank you. Thanks. Um, okay, so if um, we have no more questions so we can um, get dropped up and um, um, I would like to thank everyone um, especially Johnny for a great talk and also yeah um, that was that was great and also um, postgraduate society of Kimmohela Academy that made this event possible. Um, I want to uh, just, I want to briefly um, introduce the upcoming event. Um, it will be <clears throat> on May 4th. And this will be a talk by the Oxford professor, Pellerer. Um, the topic is hybrid linguistic identities in 19th century Lviv. And um, so he will focus on linguistic practice and social identity in Viv in historical context, and um, we will announce it a week before the event. Um, please make sure you can join us if you want. And thank you, thank you, everyone, again. And um, see you later. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Oksana. Thank you. Do pobaczenia. Dziękuję. Papa.